What do you think of when someone says a childhood illness that nearly everyone gets? Today, it would probably be chickenpox. But back before the 1960s, the answer would have been this little guy. Say hello to measles morbillivirus, or, as it's more commonly known, the measles. The two diseases may seem similar at first glance. Both are extremely contagious. Both develop red spots on the body. Both primarily infect youths. That's about as far as the similarities go, though. The rest of the symptoms are quite different. The most common symptoms of the measles are a runny nose, sore throat, conjunctivitis, a fever, and inside of your mouth these little red spots with blue-white centers called coplic spots. Additionally, other potentially more serious complications may occur as well. The measles may make you more susceptible to things like ear infections, pneumonia, and in some rare cases, encephalitis, which is inflammation of the brain. If not treated promptly and properly, encephalitis can lead to lifelong disabilities, or even death. Well, that was somber. But hey, measles! Take a look at it. Isn't it just adorable? Look at all those squiggly little arm... things. I bet it'd be a great hugger. Let's take a closer look, shall we? Closer? Closer? Okay, that's too close. Ew. This is what the measles looks like under a transmission electron microscope. Imagine millions of these things swimming around in your body. Fun! Okay, well, shall we break this sucker down? Measles morbillivirus belongs to the Paramyxaviridae family of viruses. It's an enveloped virus, which means it has an outer lipid membrane surrounding it. And on that membrane are those huggable little arms, which are actually two glycoproteins, hemagglutinin and a fusion protein. As it turns out, hemagglutinin is for hugging. It's what the virus uses to bind itself to the host cell. Then the fusion protein kicks in to help merge the virus's membrane with the host cell's membrane. This allows the virus to enter as if it were invited in for tea. Once inside the cell's cytoplasm, it gets to the hard job of viral replication. Measles is a single-strand, negative-sense RNA virus. No, this doesn't mean that it's depressive, though, let's be honest, if anyone here has a reason to be... Well, never mind. It just means that it needs to get a hold of RNA-dependent RNA polymerase before it can replicate. Oh look, it brought some with it! How convenient! With this, it can synthesize a positive-sense RNA and can start reproducing. It may seem like a bit of work to get started, but once it gets going, boy does it get going. The measles is one of the most infectious diseases in human history. In its heyday, it was everywhere. It's so contagious that 90% of the population had contracted it by age 15. To give you a better understanding of just how spreadable the measles is, let me introduce the basic reproduction number. This is a metric that agencies like the Center for Disease Control use to classify contagion rates and is listed as an r naught number. Basically, this represents the number of people that a disease is likely to spread to in an unprotected population. So a disease with an r naught number of 2 to 3 would mean that a contagious person, on average, will spread the disease to 2 or 3 unprotected people before their immune system takes it down. COVID-19, which devastated the world, has an estimated r naught number of around 2 to 8 at its peak. What's the number for the measles, then? Might want to take a seat for this. The measles has an r naught number of 12 to 18. I'll give you a minute to let that sink in. The disease spread for the measles is more than double what the highest estimated disease spread of COVID-19 was at its peak. That's pretty crazy, right? How's that possible, you ask? Well, that has to do with its mode of transmission and how it infects the body. Firstly, it's an airborne virus spread by droplets means that every time you cough or sneeze, you become a measles cannon. And believe me, you will be coughing and sneezing. A lot. It can also survive for up to two hours outside of a body, meaning that if you cover your mouth to cough, then open a door, that doorknob becomes a potential reservoir until the virus dies out. The second major factor is how it infects the body. The measles is insidious. After getting into your body, it quickly makes its way to your lungs. Once there, it runs into the internal defense force. Now, generally, your body's immune system is quite good at sussing out hostile invaders and nuking them with extreme prejudice. But what happens when the virus takes the nukes? 
Immune cells called macrophages and dendritic cells are the first to fall to the devious infection. These defense cells carry the virus to your lymph nodes, where it then spreads to the B and T cells. These cells carry the virus throughout your body via the bloodstream and drop the virus off pretty much everywhere else. This is the point when symptoms start to manifest and full-scale war breaks out in your body. Eventually, after about 7-10 to 10 days, your immune system will win and symptoms will start to fade. With how much damage the measles has done to your immune system, it may take a couple of weeks before you're back to full strength again, though. But if the measles is that insidious, that pervasive, then why haven't you ever seen it? To answer that, let's take a step back in time. The measles has been around for a really long time. The first known records of the measles date back to 6th century BCE, but it wasn't clinically identified until around 910 AD. Even after being identified, people couldn't really do anything about it. Until, that is, 1958. Enter our hero, Dr. Thomas Peebles. A man of vision, a man of determination, a man with a companion named Sam. No, not that Sam. This Sam. Dr. Samuel Katz. Together, these two giants of virology isolated the measles virus and developed the first vaccine. As much of a success as it was, it still had some pretty unpleasant side effects, and pharmaceuticals being a competition sport, a handful of other contenders leapt into the ring with their own attempts at a vaccine. By 1968, a clear winner had emerged. Maurice Hillman and his colleagues developed the combined measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine also called MMR. The MMR vaccine has been such a smashing success that we still use it to this day. How much of a success, you ask, and do I have a chart to prove it? Excellent question, and as it turns out, I do have a chart. Wow, look at that drop-off. About 4.5 million cases in 1964. By 1968, that had dropped to the thousands. If that isn't proof of a vaccine's efficacy, I don't know what is. But wait, I hear you say, I've heard the MMR vaccine can cause autism. Is that true? No. No, it's not. If you want a more detailed answer than that, Kyrgyzstat did an excellent video covering the topic, which is linked in the video description below. I highly recommend it. Since the vaccine was such a rousing success, the CDC set the ambitious goal of eliminating the measles completely from the U.S. by 1982. They campaigned hard, pushed for people to get vaccinated, and didn't quite reach that goal. In fact, in 1989, sporadic outbreaks happened around the U.S., which prompted a slew of health agencies with acronym names to push for a second dose in children. The struggle continued for another decade until, at last, in the year 2000, the measles was officially declared dead in the United States. Oh, it still pops up from time to time, carried in from other countries, and spreads to small pockets of people that have decided to not vaccinate their children for whatever reason. But those incidents get squashed pretty quickly. And so, as vaccination rates around the world continue to creep up, cases of the measles worldwide are slowly decreasing, and the future of the world begins to look 